basically I just, I kind of hit my rock bottom where I was completely depressed. I didn't want to wake up the next day. I was recovering really poorly. I had chronic pains in my ankles and knees. And I mean, for me, the biggest part was just, I wasn't the boisterous, happy person anymore. Like, Hey everybody, my name is Raw Sky and welcome to my channel. Today I have Chris Kendall joining me, who is a registered holistic nutritionist, a raw vegan lifestyle coach and raw chef and has been raw vegan for 18 years. Welcome, Chris. Hey, thank you so much, Sky. Excited to be on here. Oh, I'm excited to have you. So thank you. And I was just saying off camera, all of those bananas, they suit you. <laughs> they're, they're delicious, I tell you. I, I can't get enough, you know, and I find when I pile them this way, they just, they keep the best, you know? So sometimes I got to dig under to find the ripe ones, but it's a good way to stay uh, full on the diet, right? Yeah. And if not, you can always have a nap on them or use them for something else because you've got a lot going on there. It's true. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. Here, it creates a little farm here too. Um, so I wanted to start today for those who don't know your journey and how all this got yeah. started 18 years ago. If you'd share that with everyone yeah, today. Absolutely. And, and you know, for exactness, it's actually been 19 and a half years now. I'm oh, almost near my 20 wow. year celebration. Wow. So that will be in the spring of next year. Um, it would have been, I think, like mid April, something like that. But if wow. we want to go right to the beginning, yeah. um, you know, it all started actually in about 1998, 1999. Uh, I was living in Edmonton, Alberta and trying to become a professional skateboarder. I was moved away from home at 17 and I was drinking and smoking and partying a lot, which started as fun. And then not too long after, like a year and a half into that real super hard party scene, ended up being uh, to basically suppress, you know, and depress and, you know, numb, you know, and I was just progressively feeling worse and worse and drinking and, and eating worse and worse foods. I was eating like bacon, double cheeseburger pizzas every single day and drinking a 40 ounce of the cheapest liquor every day and smoking a pack of cigarettes every day. And basically I just, I kind of hit my rock bottom where I was completely depressed. I didn't want to wake up the next day. I was recovering really poorly. Um, I had chronic pains in my ankles and knees uh, and I mean, for me, the biggest part was just, I wasn't the boisterous, happy person anymore. Like mm -hmm. my friends, they maybe wouldn't have noticed it as much because I put on a face and there were times that I was happy, but internally I was really bummed out and felt like my dreams were falling through my fingers and just wasn't excited about life. So I knew I needed to find something. Uh, I found a yoga VHS tape in Walmart of all places it was in the dollar bin. So I got like a dollar VHS tape back when there's VHS oh. tapes and stuff like that. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I, I started playing that nonstop and I just started doing yoga every single day and it helped kind of bring peace to my mind. It started helping my body and it opened up an interest in uh, yogic literature. So I started reading about yoga and karma and my heart was opened because before that, like my sister, she went vegetarian and vegan years before that when I was 16 and I laughed at her. I thought it was ridiculous to be honest. But that wasn't my time. And this was, and my heart opened. And I was like, wow, this is insane. Like, I can't believe this. So um, it sparked an interest in nutrition and ethics around food and opened my awareness that food actually has an impact. You know, I, I, I thought this was just a pleasure to just shove food in and whatever you ate, it didn't matter, you know? Like, so I ate the, the most greasy, tastiest at that time, I thought stuff I possibly could, mm. but it was really negatively affecting me. So I, I started looking and the first book I found, I went to a used bookstore and one book jumped out. It's called Fit for Life. And uh, it's really beautiful. It's written by uh, Harvey and Marilyn Diamond, who were actually amazingly a student of T.C. Pry, uh, who is the same, same mentor that Dr. Doug Graham, the author of the 80-10-10 diet, who I met years later. They were both mentored under T.C. Pry. And it's a book that I recommend anyone because it's one of those books that like it points in a direction, but it doesn't say like, this is where you need to be. And this is perfection. It's like, no, it's like, you know, add more fruits, and vegetables to your diet, you know, lower the overall fat content, get some movement, you know, learn about food combining, um, eat fruit first on an empty stomach. You know, fruit is an amazing, almost perfect food. Eat as much as you want on an empty stomach. So it outlines a lot of really amazing key concepts that I still utilize today. 
And I started having fruit for breakfast and moving towards veganism by starting with vegetarianism. And I can tell you, you know, that was in, again, that was 99 that I made that switch. I haven't had a sick day since then, uh, except for one from stress. I had one stress day from built up stress where I just I fasted for the day and you could say I was like near sick. Yeah, that was like the biggest shift right there. And I just started reading more and more about nutrition and everything pointed towards more and more fruits and vegetables. About three years later, I was really focusing on raw food and veganism mm -hmm. and didn't quite know how to do it. I, I was reading books like Nature's First Law and the uh, mm -hmm. Sun Food Diet Success System and understanding it was, you know, like you know, Nature's First Law I was like, cook food is poison. I was like, oh, my gosh, that's a, that's that's intense. Like, OK, I want to get there, but I couldn't figure it out. And right around that time, I was really thinking about becoming a vegan chef. But I couldn't find any vegan chefing schools that wouldn't also require you to make meat dishes and, and do stuff like that. So I, I wasn't willing to do that. So instead, I went into a holistic nutrition course in Vancouver, Canada, called the Canadian School of Natural Nutrition. And it was right when I got into that, it was a year-long full-time program, that I went like committed to fully vegan. So before that, I was a little bit loose vegan and, you know, like, I uh, went from vegetarian to high raw vegan, but occasionally some things slipped like raw butter and stuff like that, that my, some of my friends still kind of convinced me it was important. And I got into that school, went to high raw vegan, which people would say raw till four now. Yeah. And midway through it, there was a vegan health festival and there was three raw speakers. And one of them was Dr. Doug Graham. And I tell you, he was glowing on stage. And I mean that in a literal sense. To me, he had a, like an aura around him. It was the first time I'd ever seen one in unaltered consciousness, I'll say, because I used to love mushrooms and stuff like that. And uh, I was just like, man, this guy's got something. And everything he said just really spoke to me on that level where like everything was just saying, yes, like, yes, you know. And so I hung out with him after I went to every lecture he did. He was really generous with his time. He was just eating a box of blueberries. I'd never seen someone just eat a case of blueberries. To me, they're always too expensive anyway, but mm -hmm. he was just eating a case for dinner. And um, he was patient and asked, answering any question I had. And the next day I went 100% raw. I won't say it was just the raw food. I think a lot of it was that I met my purpose because before this, my, this is almost five years now, uh, four and a half years of studying nutrition since I first read Fit for Life, you know, and progressing and trans, uh, transitioning from, you know, meat and dairy and all that stuff to high raw vegan and meeting Doug. But before that, all of it was just for skateboarding. I really just, I wanted to feel better, of course, and, and get past the depression and all those things and the joint pain. So there was other reasons, but it was so I could skateboard more, so I could chuck my body downstairs more and, mm -hmm. and achieve my goal of professional skateboarding. But literally that first morning, like the, the morning I was walking towards my fruit market and going to go to the uh, vegan health festival, my heart center burst open and I was walking down the street crying, just feeling so connected and so purpose driven and so much clarity. And like everyone around me, just I didn't feel separation. It was one of those Satori moments where I just felt completely connected in love with everything and everyone, like not seeing any separation. And in that moment, I knew that I really wanted to actually utilize this and teach people about holistic health and raw food and the power that that is not only for yourself, but the animals and the planet. And like it all came together for me at that moment, just boom. And um, I, I went and picked up a bunch of food at the market and went to the festival and talked to Doug again and went to all of his things. And I've been in touch with him ever since then. I feel blessed to say now we've done events together. We've co-written books together. I consider him a close friend. I've stayed at his house and you know, confer with him as a friend and colleague. And um, I've got the pleasure to meet so many other long-term raw foodists and and people from all walks of life who've, whose lives have been completely changed over the last near 20 years, going to like, I don't know, probably think 15 fruit festivals and holding almost 15 of my own events. And uh, wow, I'm really shiny here, hey? Um, that's just the light. It's not, you know, like angel kind of buzz. You know it came up when you started talking about auras as well. Oh, so no way. it's like it's perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't plan that, I tell you, but. Um, yeah, sure. You and the sun. Yeah, are yeah. I, I have the buttons and I have the light system all <laughs> set up, you know. But, um, but yeah, you know, I mean, it, it, the, the, the shortened end of that, though, because that was really the beginning, which really sparked me. And 
you know, the short end of that is even though I knew that this is what I wanted to do and I was what my calling was, it took me another four and a half years of applying the lifestyle, studying more and feeling, I guess, shaking off the procrastination and also just feeling really congruent and like competent in applying the lifestyle to teach it to others. I graduated from that uh, holistic nutrition course, which kind of gave me a good framework for doing consults and building a business around, you know, my health field. Um, but it, it took a while and it took a, a harsh breakup, which there's kind of like an ultimatum there between like get a real job and eat cooked food or live your dreams and, and you know, continue being a raw foodist. And I, of course, chose the the latter and yeah, started my website up 14 years ago now and uh, been doing it full time ever since. Haven't done anything else besides make recipe books, do consultation primarily by donation retreats and festivals and all that kind of fun stuff. And that's, uh, that's my story in a nutshell, or maybe it's a little longer than a nutshell. That's it's amazing. And what I want to ask you though, is you were walking down the street. So the first you'd had raw and then you went to sleep and the next day you had like tears coming down your face. So for people out there, what do you think it is about the raw foods that does moments like that i mean it, it it gave you more energy as well but essentially yeah. that awakening what do you believe is it about the foods well you know very truthfully i, I really think in that moment because i've had a few kind of similar moments that i would say are a little bit more attributed to the food and the perspective and kind of like mindset um and, and some practices as well and I'm, i'd like to practice yoga and stuff i think that has an impact as well but in that first, that first Satori moment, I think really what it mostly was, was just coming into contact with my true purpose. You know, it was like, like everything aligned, you know what I mean? Raw food has a big part of that because that's, you know, a big, big part of my purpose. Yeah. But I don't think it was necessarily the food itself. It was just right. the stars align, aligning, as they would say. Right. Um, but in terms of other, other kind of moments I've had like that, or other just, you know, a lot of people just find that there's more coincidences in their life and yeah. you know like you know, like oh, you know it, it creates a bit of an awareness shift and I think that there are so many aspects we could go into you know like raw food just on a cellular level wakes us up with its vibrancy you know it's high vibing and you look at the Carillion photography and there's more life force to it and you know it, it helps the body clear blockages you know by providing the nutrition and the hydration and the antioxidants and the flavonoids and all all these things that just allow the body to work in tip top shape, like it's designed to. And, you know, when you clear those filters, I often think about it, like people are a beautiful luminous shining egg, but Mm. dirt gets splashed on them and paint gets splashed on them and guilt gets splashed on them and Mm -hmm. pesticides get splashed on them. And it just creates a layer that thickens and thickens and lowers our, lowers our state of awareness of ourselves, our surroundings and the magic that is all around us. And I think as we peel those things off, we wash those things off with our, you know, our daily habits, our perspectives, you know, if we're holding the perspective of shame, guilt, fear, uh, all those things, I think they can numb our senses and disconnect us from the magic that's all around us. And, you know, as we unpeel those things, again, with our our food, our daily choices, our mindset, um, I just think our awareness goes up and we're more apt to find ourselves in those kind of higher states of being and uh, really deep states of connection with the present moment. And to me, that's what it really is. It's just when you're like fully, fully aware of the present moment and sometimes you just snap into it and it's just like, it's like you're floating and and everything is just completely beautiful and connected. And, yeah. and, um, and that can't be denied because it's experiential rather than like mental, you know? Yeah, no, that's beautifully put. And when you started this, when you went before you went vegetarian, you were suffering from depression. Did that continue at all in any of the stages? So it sounds like you went vegetarian, vegan, raw vegan. Did it continue through or was it at vegetarian? Did it stop? You know, the interesting thing is in my life, I've really come to the, I guess, experience that everything goes in cycles, you know, and that often things are really tough and then they get lighter and lighter and then they come back. But usually if you're moving in a direction, each time the the cycle returns, it's lighter and lighter and you have more perspective on it and more awareness around it, you know? So um, people say, for example, like once a smoker, always a smoker, you know, like 
I've always been a smoker, you know, like I, I started smoking when I was in grade four, you know, and like wow. still have the thoughts occasionally and still have the mindset, you know, and, and I won't even, even as a health person, I won't say I'll never ever in my life. I, I know that I can choose if I want, but I don't want to choose that. Right. Yeah. So I think it's the same with depression, you know, if, especially if we have uh, depressive tendencies and stuff like that, that, you know, it's, I think to some degree, it's always going to be a part of me, you know, mm. it's kind of embracing that shadow side and recognizing that that is a part but it's not something that I necessarily uh, wallow in or nurture anymore. Whereas, whereas before I nurtured it and a lot of people don't actually recognize that, but you know, whether it's anger, depression, or, you know, any, any number of things that people would call negative emotions or mindsets, mm. it's most often some form of attachment and some, some uh, service that that is giving you that keeps you in it, you know, like, and it's acknowledging that, you know, that the the poor me that we get attached to mm. is serving some aspect of ourself. It's just not really a healthy aspect of ourself. So I, I still have occasional moments where feelings like that I experienced back then come up, you know, mm. but they're way more few and far between. And I don't see them as ultimate truth. And before I saw them as my truth, I saw them as who I was. And now I just know that it's something I'm experiencing in the moment and you know, I can introspect and why is this happening? Is there a mindset issue? Is there a physical issue? Have I not been sleeping well? Have I been, you know, not eating the best food? Um, but more often than not, and amazingly for me, it, it goes back to the very same thing that it started with, which was skateboarding and having an identity around skateboarding and being a good skateboarder. And when I felt like that's falling through my fingers, then I'd get really sad and depressed because for a long time, that was my life's purpose. And um seeing it not be fulfilled or feeling like it would be harder to fulfill made me really depressed so um, over the years that's popped up a few times going from the identity as a skateboarder to a raw foodist to a skateboarder and then just to a human being and then having crumbs of each of those pop up in my mind and you know all that kind of stuff so I don't know if that fully answers your question but uh hopefully yeah. a little bit. no it does and with people who are healing what part do you think or how much do you feel that the food plays a part because as you said you know you did yoga you also had to reconnect to like that um what you loved which was skateboarding so what part do you believe the food plays because everyone has you know different things that they i guess could connect to yeah absolutely you know i mean i i often call the raw food diet a vortex of positive change because to me it's like a spark that ignites like the entire holistic spectrum of change and you know it reaches our social sphere it reaches our emotions it reaches like you know our familial levels and, and so many different things um so to me it's like you know food is just a spark that that begets change everywhere so uh, and i mean obviously like if you get into it for me i mean originally it was yoga i got into yoga and then that sparked mm -hmm. me into nutrition and into other things you know and into mindset and ethics right so mm -hmm. um i think it is to some degree a little different than it for everyone you know where they start but I, I think food is one of the most poignant kind of mental emotional spiritual tool shifting tools that we have at our disposal because it touches everything and mm -hmm. um I, I think that you know like it's one of the most practical ways to create massive change in our life as well, because we can really literally control it, you know, and, and grow with it. You yeah. know, like it's just what we put in our mouth and what we get, you know, so it's a, it's a easier way, I think, to integrate massive change. You know, I think like the simple, simple things like food, how much sleep you get and uh, how much exercise you get, you know, those are probably the three kind of most physicality levels of uh, health that we can like really start with and start mm. putting more attention to. And I tell you, yeah, food, it, it's crazy. The difference you can feel like I, I've often said, like if I had one superpower, my superpower would be able to just tap people in the head and let them know how amazing they can feel because I'm, I'm really confident mm. if someone could just all of a sudden go from their state where they are. Cause if we really learn in contrast, but if they could go from the state they are to feeling as light and buoyant and happy and connected as I have been and am as a stable point for most of the time, mm. I think they'd just be like, okay, what do I need to do? Like I would, I would do anything to feel like this all the time, you know? And, yeah. um, yeah. but it just takes time and experimentation and, and going for it and building reasons for people to get that motivation and to find it out for themselves. 
Yeah. And you know what? I kind of think that a lot of my strength comes from the battle it took to find the raw foods. Like, you know, I, I've said to people when I was at my sickest and, you know, having surgeries, had these top doctors, if you presented me with Doug Graham or Dr. Moss, I would have said, you don't know how sick I am. Like, and that would build, I feel like all the battles have built a strength. So as much as I, I would love I would love a world where we do that. I do. I am grateful um, for my battles in some way. Do you, what do you think about that? Are you grateful for the battles that you face? And absolutely 110%. You know, like I, I, I really sit in the belief that perfection is a process and that it's not an end state and that, uh, you know, everything we move and grow through is perfect in its place for our expanded awareness and, you know, to really experientially know the things that have deeper truths to them, you know, and uh, it's, it's not without those that we get the grit and we get the motivation, you know, it's like without the hot, there is no cold, right? And without those tough experiences, we don't rec- recognize and appreciate and feel so blessed by the easiness and the the flow that we can be in, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've had some hard trials and tribulations and and I I honestly do feel blessed by all of them. Yeah. I think, you know, you've reached a good state when you can look at your hardships as a positive, because I'm not sure what it was like for you, but when I think back that victimhood started and then that pattern of blaming something externally, and now I take full responsibility. I mean, nature was in front of me my entire life, you know, raw foods. I could have picked, like in my grandparents' garden, do you know what I mean? But I had yeah. to go through what I had to go through. So do you see that as well? Absolutely, 100%, 100%. And exactly just what you said too with it, you know, moving from victimhood to accepting your role in everything, you know, and like taking full ownership. I think that's one of the most powerful things we can do. And that's where we actually start to do things and we make change because when we're in victimhood, it's just like, oh, well, I can't control that. They did this to me. And, you know, when instead you're like, you know, this is all my choices, you know, and like even even people doing things to you, you made the choice to be in that area or to, you know, That's to right. nurture that relationship. Or, yeah. You know, like there may be some random things that if we're looking on an interpersonal level, like just, you know, like an accident where, you know, someone throws something out a window and it hits you where it's kind of hard to find your your involvement in it. But I also do believe in multiple lives and I do think that there is a truth to karma and, you know, like life choices on a a more kind of spirit level, you know, that we choose to go through these certain things for our evolution and, you know, our continued growth, you know. So on a wider perspective, I think even those things have a a purpose and reason, but for the largest extent, it's just like taking ownership of what you're creating right now, right here. And uh, are you choosing to actually actively be a positive force in your life or are you choosing to depress suppress and uh put your head down and and you know kick your feet and kick the can down the road you know yeah i guess it can get hard for a lot of people i mean looking back i feel that um a lot of and you could blame it you know we're born into this world but once again once you accept it there's such a it's, you almost feel free once you accept yeah. that you chose this way you chose before you came I, I believe I chose before I even came here to walk the path I walked and once you own that it's so freeing and and I think what's so beautiful is what can make someone so happy and well is just nature the sun um you know love loving yourself and that's all all free out there um yeah. and I yeah I think yeah, it's absolutely yeah and you know it's funny too because i think like another layer of that as well is like really honoring and marching to the beat of your drum you know and Mm. and honoring your journey and wherever it takes you and and the experiences that you genuinely feel called to to honor those to love those to love yourself and to know on a heart level that there's nothing you could choose you know uh, I'll put the disclaimers as long as you're not, you know, like infringing on other people, you know, and other animals rights, you know, I'll, I'll just say in terms of, uh, you know, our own choices that are within ourselves, there's nothing we can do that diminishes our light or that, uh, you know, makes you better or worse. It's just experiences you're calling in. And, and when you accept those things as well, and you honor your choices and your, your, your march to your own drum. I think that just brings again, that other level of freedom and connection and experience that allows us to, to rise to our highest potentials. 
Yeah. And I, I discovered when I found this path and decided to march to my own drum, um, yeah. yeah, that most of my life I'd been a follower um, and that I found comfort in following. Like, you know, you even th- I think when you're growing up, you want to have the same sort of clothes your friends wear or the same sort of trend. And when I found this, I realized there's such power in walking your own path as in you can be the leader and light for others who are in their dark times so you one thing was really strong for me is you do you sky like i think that was really it was really special i love that absolutely i mean i I have a friend uh rest in peace who passed but his hip-hop name his rap name was ubu just the letters u and b and u and uh, he, he was really big into that it's beautiful yeah i think yeah i think that's a beautiful thing so i'm going to ask now what at the moment are you eating in a day um and has it changed much from when you first began um well what am i eating in day now usually i'm eating two or three meals a day um Mm -hmm. when i first started it was more like four or five meals a day because i couldn't eat the volume that i eat now and um and it also took me it's funny like i remember like an eight or 10 banana smoothie back in the day would take me like an hour to eat. And it felt like, wow, you know, like this is intense. Whereas now I can eat 20 and 10 minutes and it feels very easy and comfortable. Mm. Um, But back to today, um, you know, I'm I'm usually again, eating two or three meals a day. If I'm eating three meals a day, it generally is something kind of juicy and sweet. So it might be grapes. It might be melons. It might be oranges, depending on the season for breakfast. Uh, lunch usually is a sweet fruit meal, especially when it's two meals a day. And often it's just a big banana smoothie, banana barley grass, banana blueberry. Mm -hmm. Um, it may instead be date and any combination, like I mentioned, but with date instead of banana, Mm -hmm. um, it might instead be mangoes. Sometimes when I'm lucky, it's jackfruit or even durian occasionally. A durian smoothie. Uh, you know, sometimes I do make what I call <clears throat> durian nog which is like a durian and bananas or just durian itself like whole durian and then dinner uh, again revolves around something juicy to start my meal and you know like lately it's been peaches uh, grapes um, sometimes melon and then I, I usually do like to make like a big stew curry salad or noodle dish you know and yeah. it varies dependent upon what I'm feeling um, some years it's just been stew, stew, stew. Some years it's been salad, salad. Some years it's been like so many noodles. I call myself a noodleitarian. Yes, and, I know uh, the feeling. <laughs> and other times I've been a curry man, just like so curry that I smell like curry under my armpits, you know. But as far as how it's changed, you know, my first five years as a raw foodist, I really came in through a hygienic kind of filter. And mm. in that, those first five years, like I saw garlic, onions, uh, spices, ginger as bad, like think, like something that I wouldn't want ever in my diet. And so mm-hmm. I was really, really simple, really, really low fat, um, mostly just juicy fruit. Actually, I, I did get into sweet fruit a little bit later, but mostly juicy fruit, tender, tender greens and fruit veggies and very, very simple meals. And in fact, <clears throat> that kind of formulated my first recipe book called uh, 101 Frickin' Ross and Recipes, which is just like Perfectly food combined, hygienic meals, one to five ingredients, and that's it. And that's really what I did my first five years. In fact, I remember like I finished that book and almost immediately after I recognized that not everyone likes to just eat that simplistic. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to create what I consider cravings busters, transitional recipes, which at that time, you know, because this was now almost 14 years ago, there was really like, a, when I put on my YouTube video, I didn't see anyone else doing raw food YouTube videos. I won't say I was the first one, but I, I didn't see anyone else doing it. And there wasn't really like the recipes availability that we have now, you know, it was like, hmm. really there was me and Doug and that was, and Frederick Patno doing some simple recipes. Hmm. And then there was really like super high fat gourmet, which was much more gourmet than we even consider gourmet today. Mm. And I wanted to try and bridge that gap and create kind of transitional low fat raw gourmet recipes. Mm. So I started kind of playing with those and developing them. But I remember going to the store and buying a jalapeno and you, you'd, you'd laugh, Sky, because honestly, I felt like a bad person buying a jalapeno because of my my hygienic mindset. Like, I won't lie, like I, I picked up that jalapeno to buy it and I checked left, I checked right to make sure no one saw me. And then I put it in my shopping cart. 
<laughs> you know, I don't find that really unusual because I I don't have anything that comes from a packet. And when I'm not well, I have old cravings and I, yeah. I bought paprika and I told mum yeah. and I'm talking to her on the phone. She goes, God, look out. Before you know it, you'll be buying slithered almonds. <laughs> Oh, no. Oh, no. Like, I shouldn't have bought it. Should I buy it? Should I try it? Shouldn't I try it? And she goes, look at like, yeah. When you put it like that, right, is you've got to, yeah, so I believe that. <laughs> it's it's pretty funny, right? The, the hoop piece we can get our mind in and, you know, it's, I, I've come to a place now where it's like, you know, I, I'm a raw foodist, not to be a raw foodist, but because of how it makes me feel and the the whole kind of bigger picture around it, you know, the bigger message around it. and. um so, you know, from there, I started experimenting with more things, you know, and, mm. you know, different spices from different ethnicities to bring different qualities to different dishes, yeah. um, you know, playing with different varieties of qualities of those to see how they feel in my body, um, experimenting with, you know, garlic, ginger, onion, and a whole host of other ingredients that in the first five years I never tried, um, you know, introduced things like mushrooms and um, I had limited exposure to like heartier vegetables those first five years, but I started incorporating more things like broccoli and cauliflower. And um, eventually I brought some sprouts back in, you know, before I got into raw food, I, I had sprout baskets all over my house and used to sprout and make my own sourdough. I even used to make my own cheese um, and stuff like that before I was vegan, all my own ferments and stuff like that. But I let it all go when I first went raw vegan because I really was, again, kind of more uh, hygienically bent mm. and uh, I experimented with all those save the cheese instead of being nut cheese, you know? Mm. And um, yeah, so I've played with a lot of different things, but when it comes down to it now, my diet is pretty darn similar, although I make a little bit more recipes and I'm not afraid to include spices or any ingredient that I want and genuinely feel called to. Um, but it's, you know, it's low fat, raw vegan. Um, I include loads of calories from fruit, you know, generally 80% or more. I, I generally follow the 80, 10, 10 kind of tenets. And I, on average, probably eat a kilo to a kilo and a half of veggies, whether that's leafy greens or cauliflower or fruit veggies, you know, sometimes it's a kilo and a half or more. That's basically it. Lots of fruit, lots of veggies. Uh, and I just follow the ones that I love the most. That's, re that's really it for me. It's like, I eat what I really feel called to that makes me yeah. smile and move my body and feel great. And uh, uh, I'm not exper not afraid to experiment and try other things. And, you know, kind of going on that same kind of thing with the uh, jalapeno and how I felt. Yeah. You know, I, I, at one point I decided to try peas, you know, and like garden peas fresh in the summer are amazing and sweet. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you freeze them, they soften up and they taste like cooked peas. Yeah. And you know, and then I started buying peas from the store, which they're blanched. So they're not technically a hundred percent raw. And I felt bad about it, you know, and, and then I came to the place where I was like, you know what, it's kind of amazing that I could be at a place where something like peas, which is probably one of the healthiest things that 99% of the people on the planet would put on their plate. I could feel like is my naughty thing. So now I laugh and say like, this is the naughty thing I do. I eat some frozen peas, you know, and like, and I don't feel bad about it at all, but, um, but it's just really funny how we can get into this, you know, state of being moving in towards more health foods and actually feel guilt or shame around foods that are still incredibly healthy. Yeah. Um, it, it's really good for us uh, just because of an ideal rather than a reality, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, so I just wanted to add that in there too. I think it's pretty amazing. And uh, I, I'm a champion for, people not feeling, you know, any negative emotion or self-judgment around food choices, just instead being aware and, you know, in the moment with all their food choices to more experientially learn what they want to continue doing and what serves them the best. Yeah. I mean, when I started, I was very disconnected from um, reading and television. So it was really my intuition. And as I um, got well, I noticed I was, I was following bright foods. Like I realized the brighter the food, the better I felt. And then when I read what other people are doing, the interesting thing is, is it the food not agreeing with me or is it the thoughts and the anxiety around it? I really think, and especially depending how unwell you might have been in the past or your past anxiety level, you can really make yourself unwell, um, like physically. 
And you yeah. think it's a reaction, right? And yeah. those things, Thoughts are really deep in. Like I know I was talking about the paprika before. There was another time I had a fresh salad and I was literally arguing with myself if I was going to put the paprika, I wanted to uh, paprika or the um, some crushed seaweed on top. And I was sitting up, down, up, down, arguing with myself. And I thought out of all the medications, the cigarettes, the alcohol, I'm arguing myself over paprika <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like it's, it's funny isn't it do you find i know you're a health coach that people can get yeah. themselves in in that state by just there's a lot of information out there as well when you start reading you can see good and bad in in everything in an orange yeah yeah it's it's absolutely amazing you know and it's the what is it the information paradox where there's just so much that it actually kind of hinders progress for a lot of people and, and that's when sometimes it's it's best to uh, just focus on one kind of program or one kind of way and, and just test it out, like and, and let go of the rest, you know, and just focus in on the simplistic stuff that we know are true. Like, I mean, fruits and vegetables are healthy for us, and getting enough sleep and sunshine and exercise, all those things. You're know, like just the tenets of hygiene, you know, they still to me ring really, really, really true. Yeah, and I I couldn't agree with you more. It's really amazing because you know an example that I'll put forth is. Um, you know, when I first got into healthy eating, food combining was one of the biggest co first concepts that totally like took me by storm. And they're just like, oh my God, this is amazing. And, you know, I researched it nonstop and applied it really, really rigorously for long, long periods of time yeah. um, and saw it kind of as black and white. Like, this is good to food combine this bad not to food combine, you know, and um, almost saw it as like a failure if I didn't food combine properly. And there's even been points, and this kind of illustrates what you mentioned as well, where literally I would get a stomach ache looking at somebody eat foods that weren't food combined. Like someone's like, oh, I made a banana orange smoothie. And I'd be like, oh, and like my stomach would hurt because yeah. of how strong that mental connection was to that being not a good combination, you know? And I, I still am a believer in food combining, especially um, the major concepts and when somebody has really delicate digestions looking to recover from digestive issues um, but it's definitely not black and white and I think there's a lot of gray there and I think that the the physicality and the mental emotional aspects of it can't be separated you know and if you're really concerned about it like like you mentioned if you're like really concerned about it and judging about it and like feeling like it's like the end of the world if you make a bad combination you're way more likely to be producing physical effects beyond just the physical effect of a poor combination and make a mountain over a molehill, you know? And I think we often make mountains out of molehills when the bigger picture is, you know, when you're, when you're eating fruits and vegetables and, you know, like taking it easy and getting the sunshine and stuff like that, then things are a heck of a lot smoother than, yeah. you know, than almost anything else you can do. Yeah, no, definitely. I think also people come from allopathic medicine where they're used to reading good and bad about things, right? And then you find a new diet and you your brain has learnt this pattern, good, bad, good, bad. It doesn't take it away when you see it, but it reads it like it's a toxic chemical. Whereas I always remind people that if you eat too many bananas or combine something wrong, more than likely you'll get a stomach ache and some gas, but it's not a serious, you're not like to, it's not a toxin and, and I think we have to remember that because some people can can think that the peas or the jalapeno are, are toxic you know and yeah life altering detrimental yeah. and you'll never you'll never achieve the highest heights of health and yeah you, know, you might as well get off that pedestal because you no longer deserve to be on it you know <laughs> no I I totally totally agree you know and uh yeah, it's it is it is pretty wild the impact that our mindset has on the lifestyle and our overall well being. You know, like you could be eating the perfect diet, but if you're stressed and you know you're judging yourself and you're looking at people around you and saying, "I can't believe they're doing that. Don't they know they're killing the environment?" It's like you're never going to achieve the highest states of health if that's your mindset. You know, and um, I've in the past done talks on you know the subject: Are you an angry vegan? You know, and there's a, there's a lot of angry vegans out there because they, they have reason to be angry. But if your goal is to be healthy and to be a shining light, you might right. want to introspect that, you know, and look into why you're angry and look if there's a another way to channel that energy and emotion into compassion and understanding and love and connection. 
Um, but it's a, uh, it's really astounding how big of an impact our mindset and uh, our stress levels have on our overall well-being and health. Yeah, I I agree. And if someone was going to start a raw diet that's listening, how would you recommend? Because you've tried different ways. Um, what yeah. would you recommend as the best in general or, or even their thoughts and how their psychology should be around it? Well, you know, I mean, uh, I, I think one, you know, it starts with like honoring thyself and, you know, the common saying, honor thyself and thy own self be true, like, you know, recognizing where you're at and what your needs are and generally how you operate. If you're kind of someone who just like runs towards things or if you like to slowly waddle towards things, you know, uh, and and recognize that. But, you know, I, I think starting with good education and support is always a great place to start. And you know, whether that's, you know, connecting with someone like yourself or myself, um, whether that's uh, reading a really good book, you know, to me, the 801010 diet is probably the best book out. Actually, I wouldn't even say probably, I think it's the best book out there, really wrapping everything up in a really good way. Um, and giving a good, good, solid understanding and head start. And, you know, from there, you know, just adding in more fruits and vegetables into your life, you know, and I often just say, you know, like, just try starting fruit for breakfast, you know, and, and trying not to overeat too late at night, you know, like, yeah. so that you're not waking up with a sour stomach. So just fruit for breakfast and include more greens and uh, slowly incorporate more fruits and vegetables into your life. And, you know, generally speaking, those changes bring about shifts that beget more change, you know, and, uh, continue to read and research and learn more with the lifestyle, you know, and uh, I think, I think that's a really good starting point. And, and as I mentioned before, it, it just really is a, a vortex of positive change. So you start making these positive changes and it just begets more and more change. And it's recognizing that it's a marathon. It's not a race, you know, like respecting your own pace and being flexible and, uh, incorporating more of the fresh foods you definitely enjoy and trying new recipes, all those kinds of things, all of that goes a long way towards uh, making it a smooth transition, you know? What about people who, um, I'm not sure if you have many people that come to you that are seriously ill. Do you yeah. recommend a modality like juicing or fasting? What are your, what happens there? You know, I've definitely helped a lot of people and connected with a lot of people from all manners of degenerative disease and illness. And it is it is truly, really individual. You know, like mm -hmm. the changes that you're willing to make are the most profound and the ones that you're willing to make without feeling like you're overly stressing yourself out. You know, that's generally the most helpful. Um, and it depends upon each specific illness, someone with diabetes compared to someone with cancer or MS or, you know, you know, colitis, you know, or Crohn's, all of those may have a subtle shift and urgency to them or lack of urgency, you know, so, um, you know, as far as specific modalities, you know, I'm, I'm really a champion of, <clears throat> of the lifestyle and whole foods. I'm not anti anything else, but um, myself, I'm much more drawn to, you know, fruit and tender greens as the, as the staple. And then, having some fluidity around that and whether that means fluidity in terms of like, you know, juices or green powders or water fasting or low fat raw gourmet or, you know, like stuff like that. To me, those are determined by the individual, their preferences, what they enjoy the most, what they feel intuitively drawn to. Um, and, you know, again, their specific situation and, uh, <clears throat> and what they're going through, you know, but, um, often in more kind of intense kind of chronic cases, uh, we focus on building the lifestyle that again, suits their needs and suits their desire, um, based around fruit meals, a lot of mono eating, uh, well food combined fruit meals, smoothies, green smoothies, salads. Um, and then if they're having a hard time getting enough greens in recommending green juices, uh, green powders stuff like that, you know, so that's, and generally speaking too, like <clears throat> if I'm talking to someone who's brand new to it compared to someone who's been, you know, doing raw food for a few years, it might be a little bit different as well, you know, because generally speaking, sure. um, generally speaking, I, 
recommend employing the lifestyle to get a real good grip on the lifestyle before doing something more intense, like say like a prolonged juice fast or a, a water fast, just so that when they come out of that, they have that really concrete base to go back to. Because, you know, going from like water fast to back to sad and then juice fast and then back to sad and then a little bit of raw food and then back to sad, like that's really jarring on the system. So getting a really firm, competent base and understanding experientially of like, you know, uh, streamlined consistency with, uh, you know, whole foods and smoothie and juice based raw food diet that is sustainable and they can hold their weight is Mm -hmm. what I think is a very, very invaluable tool. Yeah. to get to a place that where you go, okay, well, I've been doing this for a year, I've been doing this for a year and a half. And there's still some lingering things that I'd like to resolve. Okay, well, maybe I'll look into a juice fat, or maybe I'll look into mono island, and just do one fruit for a while, or maybe I'll consider a water fast. But again, that's all dependent upon the individual, their condition, their temperament, their mindset, because, mm-hmm. you know, if somebody has a history of eating disorders, I'm, I'm probably not going to re- recommend or direct them towards more stringent protocols and more really focus on lifestyle and abundance, you know? Mm. Um, but if someone has cancer, then I, I might be recommending that they consider a water fast, you know, or they may consider a prolonged juice fast or mono fast. Right. So mm. um, it, again, it really is interpersonal and dependent upon the individual. Yeah, it sure is. I loved hearing you say that because I am exactly the same and w- about the lifestyle needs to be there, like to do the lifestyle. And what comes with that is when I got well, it was a beautiful experience as opposed to I think if it was something that was from where I was that was very, very difficult, I think this, the mentality of it would I'd destroy myself again. That's just me. I mm. Everyone's different. But I love that even if I feel like I'm going off track a bit, I'm like, well, what did I do at the start? Like it's happily yeah. sits in my heart ready to help me through anything I go through. So I like that. It's great advice. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's one of those things that at one of my retreats, the mantra was I can't F up, you know, it's just, uh, I can fail to learn the lesson or I can fail to see the insights that are in this moment. Right. And it's like, I agree. Whenever we find ourselves off track, I don't think we're ever off track. It's just, we're on a meandering path. You know, life isn't a straight line. You know, I, I said in an interview yesterday, you know, the only things that uh, go in straight lines are bees and geometry, but bees don't actually either. They, they kind of meander and you know, we just say bee line, right? Because it's a yeah. direct path. But, um, you know, nothing's in a straight line in this life. There's always curves and, and side detours and, you know, experiences to pick up and gain extra insight and, you know, extra oomph in it. Because like we said earlier, it really is those contrasts that, yeah. bring clarity you know and bring more motivation and purpose and uh you know if if we are aware and we are accepting and loving of ourselves and everything that we call we choose to call into our experience i think we're way more apt to have an easier ride and to really get those things from it because what i've really found what has been profound for me in my life is when I had judgment and guilt and shame and fear around food choices that weren't the ideal, perfect, hygienic, raw food choice, Mm -hmm. those were more taking more time in mind, real estate and causing more mental anguish um, and also more apt to repeat than when I let go of all those things and just said, this is a food choice. It doesn't determine who I am. It doesn't determine my self-worth. It doesn't make me a better or worse person or know make me a failure as a raw foodist um and i chose to make it a meditation and actually when i chose to eat those foods and really slow down and and be present with them the energy that was drawing me to those foods completely left you know the reality of the food was in light whereas before when i had guilt and shame and fear built up around them i wasn't present in eating them and i i just like wolfed them back you know the experience of like you you ate something is like where did it go you know and because I didn't accept it because I didn't accept myself and because I didn't um, actually be pre- wasn't actually present in that moment. Mm-hmm. It was called back into my experience because something in me was asking me to see it, to have that experience, but I wasn't experiencing it. I, I wasn't actually there. And uh, so for me, the, the practice of presence and acceptance and self love um, and honoring what we actually ask to be called into ourselves and, 
you know, that, that doesn't necessarily mean like anything you think like, oh, well, I want to do this. Okay, I'm going to just do that. Well, sometimes there's room for introspection and, and feeling it out and thinking about it and, you know, planning, you know, when I first wanted to uh, deviate, actually, it wasn't my first time, but when, one of the times I wanted to deviate from the lifestyle, I said, okay, well, I really want these nacho chips, but I'm going to give myself a week where I like, you know, I, I eat really perfectly. I get more calories. I get more exercise. I make sure I'm hydrated. I get a lot of sleep and like, I, I bring in more things that I really like, maybe have a durian party, you know, just to make sure I'm treating myself. Yeah. And then at the end of that week, I still want that. I'll allow myself to have it, but I'll be totally present. I'll make a meditation out of it. And and that was to me the, the complete turning point that wow. changed my whole trajectory with cravings and raw food and guilt and sh- shame around food. Cause I did, I, I, I chose it. I was conscious in it. I, I was accepting of myself and I realized I didn't really want it. it. It was something else. You know, it wasn't the food itself, you know, that was drawing me to it. And after that, I was like, okay, this isn't really a draw anymore. It almost sounds like self-love. So you said, I'm going to um, look after myself, sleep better, make sure I have enough calories, um, throw myself a little party. Um, and that self-love might've been what you were lacking. And then we try and find it, you know, elsewhere so that's a good that's good advice like go out there and give yourself lots of love before you go in and and absolutely yeah because it it is very often uh some hole we're trying to fill with something that doesn't really fill it you know and so if we can find different coping mechanisms and different ways to truly nourish and nurture and love ourselves that actually get us what we're looking for we're we're way more likely to feel kind of calm centered and, and move past it with more grace and ease yeah I like that. So I have some questions from people. So I've got here, do you recommend any supplements? You know, I think that's another kind of individual thing. Um, But the main one that I would say is is good to be aware of. And I I do recommend, especially after a few years of the lifestyle or even in the first year or two, if you like, um, to get your basic kind of blood levels checked in a urine test. And um, I, I think it's important for a lot of people's confidence in the lifestyle too, to get those numbers and to check things out and to look for trends. Um, One test in isolation isn't really super valuable. It's valuable, but not super valuable. But where you see the the true value is having multiple tests so you can see trend lines and see where certain values are going and see if they're stable or if things are going down. And the thing that I've seen the most consistent uh, to be a potential issue is vitamin B12 and vitamin D dependent upon where people live and their overall lifestyles. Um, In a roundabout way of answering that, I was very, I wouldn't say I was completely anti-supplement, but I was kind of coming from a place of pride that I felt like if I didn't need to supplement, that was better and it proved that the diet was perfect and that I was a better person in some kind of form, you know, like I don't even need to supplement anything, you know, and I really had some pride around that. And over 10 years of, you know, simple raw food, I saw my B12 levels go down over four different blood tests to the point where uh, I became symptomatic and, uh, and it was really a stressful situation. I was just like going off the handle at little teeny things. I didn't have the ability to cope with stress very well. And uh, my back was hurting and a couple other little kind of nagging symptoms, but I was clinically deficient. And so I started supplementing that. And so I still supplement B12. Mm-hmm. Um, coming from Canada, most of the years I travel during the winter and get sunlight, but there have been some years where I haven't, or the one year where I got hit by a truck and was mm-hmm. dealing with healing a lot of bones and I missed half the summer, wasn't outside and didn't travel all winter. I supplemented with vitamin D to make sure I had that so I could heal my bones really well and you know all the other beautiful hormonal uh, importance of having uh, adequate levels of vitamin D. But those are the two that myself in the last 19 and a half years have supplemented is vitamin B12 and vitamin D on occasion. I now actually have a uh, vitamin D lamp that during the winter months, I, I treat myself to getting you know the vitamin D lamp. And otherwise I eat mushrooms that are sometimes put under the lamp or put out in the sun that also has vitamin D in them. Yeah. And uh, otherwise I, I prefer to be out in the sun and, and you know, taking a tropical vacation during the winter. Um, I'd say the only other thing that I've, I've personally 
um, supplemented is, you know, barley grass juice powder, which isn't technically a supplement, but some people may say it's kind of in that scheme because I, I take it because I love it and my body enjoys it. And like the flavor to me is amazing. And I prefer say a banana smoothie with barley grass juice powder over a green smoothie with lettuce or celery. Like I'll, I'll have those, but I, my favorite green smoothie in the world is just bananas with barley grass juice powder. My, my body sings when I have it. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's, it's very nutrient as a nutrient dense powder. And that was another thing that for a long period of time, I thought like, that's just a joke and I would never use a green powder or anything like that. And then I experimented with some and I found benefit in this. And uh, so now I include it. Um, but, uh, you know, to round that kind of whole kind of question out, I'm by no means anti-supplement in any way, shape or form. I think in a lot of times and cases, way more is taken than is necessary, uh, especially in the context of a whole foods based raw food diet. I don't think we really require much outside of that as long as we're looking at quality and, uh, you know, abundance, um, but at the same time, if anyone's deficient or has an issue or has an absorption issue or some genetic kind of trait, then, you know, it's, it's important to have this information and to not feel bad or afraid to supplement when and if necessary and try and fill in the gap in the lifestyle or uh, um, in the lifestyle or the diet to try and fill that up so that it is no longer required. And that's, you know, kind of my view and my aim with uh, my coaching. Okay. Well, thank you for that. So I'll go on from that because something you mentioned about the fracture or the accident you had. So someone's written here, um, please ask about how eating raw can assist with uh, connective tissue healing and fracture healing. So I know you've got experience yeah. here. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I I got into this to heal faster. Like that's the, one of the main reasons I got into raw food and I've, I've hurt myself more than most people. There are people I know that have hurt themselves more, but I've hurt myself a lot. Like I've rolled both my ankles at least a hundred times. I've broken my wrist four times, cracked a rib two times, motorcycle accident, completely tore my ACL, broke my shin. Um, yeah, four concussions, lots, lots of accidents, I'll just say. Um, and what I generally find, you know, just through living a simple fruit and vegetable based lifestyle that is really centered around abundance, you know, and um, including a lot of greens and including all the variety that you can enjoy and introducing different foods and from different groups and not being afraid to overeat on fruit, you know, and all that kind of stuff um, <clears throat> that I feel in generally just almost like two thirds between a half and two thirds of the time of the average person, you know, and even compared to myself, because I've broken some things before raw food and broken some things after raw food, the same thing, like my wrist, you know, in slightly different spots. You don't really usually break in the exact same spot because the body makes it even tougher in the place you break it. Mm -hmm. But um, between that and between the motorcycle accident, which was really, really major, and talking with my rehab specialist and my chiropractor and my surgeon about my progress and healing is consistent that I just, I heal very, very well and faster than the average person. And it just makes sense. You know, it's, it's actually not that I'm healing faster it's that most people are healing slower than their body is capable of because they're so bunged up with an unnatural diet and lifestyle and they're overburdening their system where their body is dealing with the things they're doing to themselves rather than having the vitality to simply heal how it's designed to when your body is unburdened by, you know, self-inflicted challenges, you know? So um, I, I did a whole presentation on that recently where it's like, yeah, we're, we're not really speed healing, but we heal faster than most people. Um, one thing that I have, there's a few things that actually, when we talked about kind of like changes in the diet, there are a few things that I have added to my diet in the last five years, uh, that I've been experimenting with that I've found personal benefit from, you know, the first one that was kind of outside the line was probably the barley grass juice powder. Um, lately I've been eating sprouts and I, I really do enjoy, you know, like legume sprouts and mung bean sprouts. And I've had long periods of time with and without, and I'm definitely not in the state where I think that they're necessary, but if they're enjoyed, they're a great uh, accompaniment to the diet and a cheap way to get some free fresh, fresh vegetables. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the last year and a bit, I've been uh, playing around with actually two years now, uh, sea moss and uh, Irish moss. And I, I really enjoy that. And I find benefit from it. I've noticed some little changes and a few dry patches on my skin or just even like nicer, softer skin from having it. 
I, I really like sea vegetables where for a long period of time I didn't have them. And, and now I've been eating dulse and uh, especially nori more often. For a long period of time, I didn't eat nori because, uh, you know, it's really hard to find raw and it's very questionably vegan most of the time. But I found certified raw, vegan, kosher, organic nori, which is routinely tested for heavy metals and radiation and stuff. So I've been incorporating that more often and I really love it. But yeah, I, I know I got a little bit off topic there. But uh, oh, no, I think all of that's important. So yeah. And I, I, what I also wanted to ask is, did you find any of the doctors said that you were tolerating your pain level for your accident better or they gave you less medication and, you know, they had to give you some sort of medication and you didn't need as much because, you know, maybe because you're raw. Did you find anything like that? I think I've always had a decent pain threshold. I, I definitely do not have the highest of some people. I know I know some people that are way tougher than me, um, you know, uh, but I feel like I have a higher pain threshold. Like, for example, I've, you know, I've had uh, dentist experiences where I, I got amalgam fillings taken out and replaced, you know, like multiple. I had a, I used to, when I used to have bad, bad uh, cavities when I was younger, before raw food, actually, way worse teeth before raw food than since raw food. But when I got those amalgam fillings taken out and drilled out, I think I had like five taken out at once. I didn't use any painkillers or anything like that. I just let them do it all. And they were really shocked that I wasn't like you wow. know, crying and cringing. It was uncomfortable, but that was about it. They didn't hit any nerves. If they would have hit nerves, I would have. Yes. But, um, and then uh, with the motorcycle accidents and stuff like that, amazingly, I mean, there was moments of pain for sure. Absolutely. Um, but I mean, when I woke up from that, they had me so drugged up. I didn't feel anything like nothing. Um, and uh, without going too much into it, it's pretty amazing. Like the day after they already had me on crutches trying to walk around and like trying to, you know, get mobile and stuff like that and not put my foot on the ground, um, you know, but to move my body and be in that upright position and it hurt, but it wasn't horrible. But then the next day when they came to do it, um, I swung my leg off the bed and tried to stand up and immediately I was bawling and crying and like, I can't do this. Oh my God. Oh my God. And it hurt so much. Like, I just felt like, like my leg was just being like attacked. Like it was just so intense. And what I didn't learn though, until after that was that, you know, they had me on a drip, uh, with the IV drip with painkillers in it, but they weren't refilling it unless I asked for it. And I didn't know that they never even told me that. So my painkillers had completely worn off a hundred percent. And when I was laying in the bed, it was bearable. It wasn't bad. But as soon as I swung my leg off to try and get on crutches oh. with zero painkillers, just, you know, like less than 48 hours after a near life death, death accident, I, I, yeah, I, I was crying. It was really, really bad. And then after that, I was like, not, not afraid to push the pain pill while I was in the hospital. Um, you know, but I had to, like, it was really silly there too. Like, you know, the pain medication would wear off around two or three in the morning, but instead of them just coming around it, like, 2.30 and pushing the button for me, you have to wake up in pain and then request it yourself. Yeah. It just makes so little sense to me, you know, at least for when you're sleeping and recovery to be able to sleep well. I think it would make much more sense if it was applied. If you're unwell and needing to heal, any stress response in the body is going to slow healing as well. So if you're woken exactly. up and you're distressed and you've already got been through a, a trauma, so you've got that to add to what's going on and then you've got to calm back down. It's like an up-down, right? Absolutely. And, and likely, you know, like at least a half an hour of progressively feeling more and more uncomfortable and having poor quality sleep before you actually wake up from the pain. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, have to call them and wait a half an hour for it to kick in and then slowly get back to sleep. I mean, yeah, but that's, uh, you know, out of the scope of most people in most situations, you know, but uh, yeah, in general, I feel like I, I tolerate pain pretty well. And as soon as I got out of the hospital, for example, I didn't need any pain medication. You know, I, I let go of that. Um, I did use marijuana. I used that as a painkiller in traumatic experiences and feel like that's a much, much better choice than pharmaceuticals. Um, but uh, I recently had a uh, ankle surgery, getting the plates out from that main surgery. And it... Uh, uh, yeah, same thing. I didn't, I didn't, they gave me pain pills, but I never even used any of them at all, you know? So I don't, I don't know if it's the diet. I don't know if it's just because I've hurt myself so many times over the years that I'm just used to pain, you know? Um, yeah, I can't, I can't say a hundred percent for sure beyond my experiences with that. Well, you've been through a lot. You've lived. 
Yes, I have. Yeah, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a Leo, um, and uh, my parents say I'm on my last life because I, I genuinely have almost died at least at least six or seven times. You know, like yeah. I've been run over by a van and fallen down an elevator shaft and Easy. ate a cactus and almost fell off the Grand Canyon off the trail into the Grand Canyon and you know, like <laughs> very legitimately, I've almost died more than a few times in the motorcycle accident and I once jumped off of a cliff onto a, a, a boulder the size of a car that was balancing on a rock that was like a hundred feet high. I get pictures of me jumping this like six foot gap onto this rock that was just balancing. When I landed on it, the whole rock went. And if it would have just ticked a teeny bit more, the whole rock would have fell over 150 feet into the crevice. So like a little things like that, you know, so I'm uh, counting my blessings and being a little bit of a safer lion these days. Jesus. Wow. If not, you could always start a YouTube channel for Chris's exploring experiences. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> God. All right. Well, how about one more question? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm free for anything. Okay. So I liked this one. So how do you manage the anxiety of eating socially when no one else eats like you? I think that's a really great one, you know, and, uh, I would like to start with that, that I think that, you know, when you're the the odd one in the group, it's, there's going to be challenges that come up and there's going to be moments in your application of this lifestyle where you're going to feel anxious, uh, embarrassed, weird, um, you know, you know, not accepted, you know, that's just par for the course. You know, that, that really is, that's just a part of the experience. Like it, and what I've found is that it takes relaxing and playing with it and um, trying on different ways of approaching it and uh, being patient with the experience to try enough things out to find, you know, one where you just like, it's no longer a big deal to you anymore. You know, it's just about how can I play with this and make it more fun? How can I, you know, create better connection around it? How can I, um, you know, maybe make a better impression so people find what I'm doing more attractive? Um, but that just takes time and experience and patience. And, uh, but for me, if I wanted to try and fast track somebody with that, you know, it'd be just really sitting in the recognition of how powerful this choice is that it's like one of the, it's like the best thing you can possibly do for yourself, for the planet, for the animals and for your friends and family, because you living this way opens up that door as an option, you know, and you know, you really owning it and recognizing that this is an amazing choice. I have nothing to be embarrassed about, nothing to feel ashamed of. Um, and I don't need to be judgy towards anyone else. I can just live in my truth. And the more open I am to living in that and feeling good about my choices and not feeling embarrassed about it, the more attractive it is to others. So like seeing that as the challenge, not seeing the challenges, like, you know, what are other people having? What are other people thinking more so like, what am I thinking and, and how can I make this easier on myself? And, you know, for me, the things that make it easier is one being really well grounded that this is just an amazing choice and I feel good about it. Um, and two, um, recognizing when we go to these social events, it's not about food, like people make it about food, but it's about connection. It's about the people you're seeing. So let go of the thought about the food. Who cares? Like someone might be eating a steak, someone might be eating a salad, someone might be eating oranges who cares? Like really to me, like whatever, like so often we go to restaurants and people order different things all the time. Why does it matter that mine's uncooked or doesn't have some animal bits in it? You know, like it's what you focus on that brings the most uh, attention. And I don't need to focus on my food. Someone might focus on it and bring attention to it. And I go, Oh yeah. Like I, I like bananas. Okay. Like, so what's going on? Like, how have you been, you know, like mm. actually put that attention and focus onto the relationships, the conversation. Um, and again, just that reality that, you know, if, if you're comfortable, then other people are going to be comfortable around you. If you're not comfortable and you're anxious and you're feeling weird, they're going to be like, what the heck? Okay. I don't want to do that. That guy looks like a freak, you know, like, yeah, you know, so it's, it's what that, we make of it. That's important though, because when I started going out to restaurants with family and friends, I just got well and I was so happy. I was just in love and I still am and people see that and they're like what's she having what has she ordered what and then you leave the restaurant or the event and you've I was feeling so good I couldn't believe it if I ever got managed to get out I felt worse after a restaurant like swollen heavy mm. afterwards I was like 
Oh, this is great. There was, yeah. So it's how you look at it, isn't it? Because people respond to that. Absolutely. And then there's all obviously like some practical things you can do to make it easier. Like if I know I'm going somewhere where there's going to be food this tempting, well, I, I make sure that I eat something I love beforehand and enough of it that I'm like, I'm totally full. So if I don't eat anything at the event, I'm fine. But then I'll still bring something else that I love and I may want to share, you know, so like sometimes I go to, uh, you know, events or restaurants and I bring like a bag full of fruit or sometimes I might just, you know, if I'm going to a restaurant where I know I'll have a salad, I may bring some extra tomatoes and avocado and maybe a mango or something so that I know that I have something that's going to make it because, you know, let's face it, sometimes you go to a restaurant and even with their best intentions, they make a crap salad that's like way smaller than you want. So making sure that you have food beforehand, you're you're satisfied calorie wise, and then having some extra little tidbits so that you can make something special there, awesome. And um, if it's a more uh, kind of casual event rather than a restaurant, well, you know, make a dish you really love and and make a bunch of it, you know, and and share some of it if you want. And you know, like all of that stuff can be fun. I've made recipes and brought them into restaurants, and you know, talk to the waitress and. I, I sometimes make a game out of it. You know, to me, that's one of the big things too, is just not taking things so seriously, not making mountains out of anthills or molehills, like we said, and um, recognizing in most situations, people want you to be comfortable and want to do what they can to help you. And if you're vulnerable and open to asking for help and also uh, able to just convey clearly what you need, you're much more likely to get it than if you're just sitting there nervous and and not asking or not putting out those things out there. So I've been in restaurants and just like, you know, said funny things just to have fun, like to tell the waitress, like, Hey, I'm sorry. I'm a weird Italian. Like I can't really eat anything on the menu. Can you just like bring me a salad with lots of lettuce and tomatoes? And, you know, if you have avocado, some avocado on the side and, you know, people are really accommodating. And I generally find uh, asking for what you want rather than, trying to overly explain what you don't want is, is pretty helpful. And just like, just this, I, I just, a, a big plate full of tomatoes would be like amazing, you know, like, you know, and uh, I find that just makes it a heck of a lot easier. Yeah. I like all that. I think it's great advice. I know I sometimes also will bring my own dressing. So I'll order something yeah. and, then, and then you can also talk to people at the table or at the social event. So it's, you know, about, what it is it's a, it's a talking point absolutely. absolutely and then and then people ask questions and there's nothing more yes. potent than that you know like we can we can be trying to say something till we're blue in the face but when people ask questions and they're genuinely interested it's going to sink in way way more and create a deeper connection rather than a, a headbutting of trying to be taught or told something you know that's right. And you have to remember you're there for the people and the celebration you actually aren't there for the food the food's just supposed to complement that yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's so funny. It's so funny, Sky, because uh, I've over the years with raw food heard people say like, oh, God, like you guys are so con- so uh, obsessed about food or this or that. And it's like, I don't really think so. Like, you know, when I see other people traveling, like they're traveling based on the restaurants they're going to and they're like, you know, spending so much time and money and energy going to restaurants and all this stuff. And like when I travel, I just want to get the best produce I can and then go experience things, you know, like go do yes. stuff. And, you know, it's like, to me, this is about bringing up the quality of experience so that we can enjoy life, you know, like yeah. it's not just about the food, you know, like, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing that we're so blessed with such beautiful, delicious food. And I love having fruit lucks and, and potlucks with people and making special dishes and you know, having durian parties, you know, but all of it is just to feel amazing so that everything else is better. Well, there's what I noticed. So I got partially well a few years back and went to Bali. And when I did that, I went with like family and sister and that to night spots and restaurants and, you know, shopping. And this time when I went, I was raw vegan, been raw vegan for a year and a half. It was all about the fruit, but it was all about the vibe of Bali. Like I could feel different places and energies and there's a whole world that hasn't been tapped if you yeah. um, are going to places just focused on, you know, the the restaurant or, or the bar or something. It was like a whole new world. Absolutely. You're, you're actually deeply connecting with the roots of the culture. Yes. Right? It's like it's actually sinking into the, the physical roots, you know, and uh, 
and the vibe rather than the the stuff that's a little bit above that. I think all of it's great, you know. Yes. I'm not trying to question all of it, right? But it it is pretty amazing just to, the the difference of the experience when you are really sinking into like what the people are growing and what is what is natural there and all those different things, experiencing it on that really juicy, high vibrancy level. And what's really funny is I went to a day bar, a couple of them, with my um, sister and my brother-in-law, and I ordered, and see, this is what it's all about, right, is I ordered, um, There's a sh- you can order shots of wheatgrass, coconut water, turmeric, and maybe ginger, and then I'm, like, yeah. doing <laughs> shots dancing, and I did not stop dancing. So everyone yeah. else is getting tired, and I'm like, whoa, the coconut's kicking in, and... <laughs> And then you didn't feel ruined the next day. And oh. I, I love it. I, I, I do the same thing, you know, Sky, something I've, something I've done definitely more than a handful of times is have a 40 ounce, you know, a beer bottle or even like a alcohol bottle and fill it with orange juice or fill it with banana smoothie. I've, I've showed some parties with my 40 ounce bottle that is filled with banana smoothie, but has the paper bag around it. Just like, you know, the old days yeah, when I used yeah, to yeah. have those gangster ghetto parties. And, you know, like just, just sipping on it, still enjoying, you know, like people don't know. And then when they ask, like, yeah, this is the hard stuff, try it. And I'm like, like oh, like, <laughs> yeah, I, I know um, a friend of mine who is a raw vegan, she takes um, grape juice in a wine glass. And yeah. I'm like, you know, and people don't really know the difference. But when they do, once again, it's a talking point, right? So they're, interested she's yeah. still having fun and i think that's the other thing right is you can move across to alcohol here is is you don't have anything when you're out even the food can change your personality a bit and people i think can think sometimes they're not going to be the same i promise everybody yeah. said i'm like so much funnier i'm a pleasure to be around they're happier that i'm like the way i am it's, and it's just such an avenue for self-growth and discovery you know and like Sure, you the first time you do that, maybe you'll be a little self-conscious and maybe you'll second guess yourself and maybe some of the old patterns will come up, but that's not a bad thing. That's just something to recognize and learn to grow through, you know. And yeah. the other side of that is being more self-aware, more relaxed, and more truly yourself without being encumbered by the situation or other people's or your own thoughts, you know. So um I, I think it's a beautiful thing. And, and just like I said before, in all these social circumstances, generally it, it it's new it takes some time you know you're probably going to be uncomfortable you're going to go through a few situations and moments that are challenging but the more open you are to moving against that for the purpose of self-growth and and shining this light on this amazing powerful you know purpose-driven choice uh, the easier and easier it gets and the more rewards you know and like i i think the same thing as a talking point having those things at parties and and you're like i I've been to bars with like bok choy in my breast pocket and just like taking bites of bok choy and dancing and stuff like that. And like people laugh and people think it's fun, especially if you're having fun and doing it and just enjoying it. And uh, not only does it become a talking point, but it becomes an inspiration. And right, I think so many people in this life, they're just in their hoopty and they're in their, their rut. And I don't know a lot of people that are really genuinely proud of their drinking and other things like that. Um, they just do them, you know, it's just, it's just automatic and it's an escape, but, you know, having a light and showing another way sometimes is the end, that impetus for them to really introspect and create uh, more joy, health and uh, awareness in their own life. So it's uh, untold benefits. I think if you are having fun and you're happy, people then just generally want to know how that happened. And I think that also shows that many people aren't happy if they're looking, you know, out to other people. So you can be a real, as you said, an inspiration. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a, that's a blessing and a gift as well. And it, you know, it can be one of those reasons why you do things as well, you know, to be able to positively impact others. So it uh, helps keep you on the track. Mm. Well, before we go, I was wondering, do you have one mantra or one sentence or maybe even a paragraph um, that yeah. you would want to share that you believe could help anybody or get them started or make a shift? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, my, my most consistent one has been breathe love. You know, that's just uh, uh, anytime I'm in in challenging spot, I just think breathe love and then I actually practice it. You know, like I 
take a deep breath. And I, I envision it as just like universal love, just going right into my heart and, and going through my entire body. And for me, it just softens everything. You know, it's a, uh, doesn't matter the situation or what's happening. If I just breathe in love and I, I focus on that, it, it changes my whole reality. So that'd probably be the, the number one, one that I could think of. And, um, I think beyond that too, just that, uh, kind of mantra of, you know, you can't mess up, you know, that's been a powerful one too. It's just like, you can just fail to be aware, you know, so like just trying to build awareness and, uh, you know, acceptance of what is and see how you can be aware and how you can leverage the reality, uh, to your growth or to your embitterment or, um, you know, if not, then just to be more aware in general. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And I'll put Chris's details below so you can get in touch with him and contact him. And yeah, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much, Sky. I really appreciate you. So much love to you and all you're doing and for having me on. It's definitely been a blast. Every time we talk, it's a lot of fun. And I can't wait for a durian party or something, you know, something fruity and juicy somewhere. That sounds good. Anytime. Um, and everybody listening, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please subscribe below and I'll see you all soon. Bye. Bye. -bye.